Haymitch is one of my all-time favorite characters from the Hunger Games series. He was perfectly cast in the films, with Woody Harrelson taking on the role of the alcoholic Victor. As good as his performance was, however, the films cut a lot of detail from the books. I feel as though the films did not do his character justice. So, I'm going to try and do what the films could not. I'm going to try and give his character justice as I explain and go through the entire life of Haymitch from the books. Haymitch was born into the Abernathy family 40 years before the book series took place. He was from District 12, the smallest and poorest of them all. He lived with his mother and his younger brother. As a boy, he looked young, strong, and was something of a looker. While in the films, he had blonde hair and blue eyes, traits people from the merchant section or the richer section of 12 tended to have. In the books, however, he had curly dark hair and gray eyes, traits of people from the seam, the poorest section of 12. One thing we can take away from this is that because he lived in the seam, his dad most likely worked in the mines. We know that this is an extremely dangerous job and kills many coal mines miners every year, including Katniss's father, so it's very likely that his father died in the mines. This means that a very young Hamish had to step up to be the man of his family and to provide for his younger brother and mother. It's very likely that he did this by adding his name for the reaping more times than he had to. You can opt to add your name more times than you already have in exchange for Tessera. Each time you do this, you get a year's supply of grain and oil for one person. When Hamish was in his mid-teens, he met and fell in love with the wonderful girl who he made his girlfriend. When Hamish was 16, the second quarter quell took place, meaning the 50th Hunger Games. To celebrate this anniversary, the capital decided to double the amount of tributes. The normal number of 24 tributes became 48, two boys and two girls from every district. Being 16, that meant that Hamish automatically had his name in for the reaping five times because it goes up one every year from the age of 12. But theorizing that he had to add his name more times to provide for his family meant that he probably had his name in there many Many more times than that. To the horror of his mother, brother, and girlfriend, Hamish was one of the males chosen to participate that year. Odds were that Hamish stood even less of a chance than any tribute in any previous Hunger Games. This is because there were twice as many people after you and twice as many people to kill. And on top of that, there had only been one other District 12 member to win the games. The odds were not in Hamish's favor. Mesa Lee Donner, a girl who was from the merchant section, was one of the girls chosen. When she was called, she grabbed onto two other girls, and one of them turned out to be Katniss's mother. Hamish said goodbye to his family and girlfriend, and for all they knew, it was the last time that they would see each other. Hamish, Mesa Lee, and the other District 12 tributes were sent off to the capital to begin their Hunger Games journey. All four of them were trained by the only District 12 victor in history. He was on the older side and most likely didn't provide very much help. For the parade, Hamish and the other District 12 tributes were dressed in terrible coal mining outfits. When it came time for the interviews, Caesar Flickerman asked Hamish, what do you think of the games having 100% more competitors than usual? Hamish replied saying, I don't see that it makes much of a difference. They'll still be 100% as stupid as usual, so I figure my odds will be roughly the same. The audience burst out laughing, and Hamish gave a half smile that was snarky, arrogant, and indifferent. The interview did not make Snow happy, and it put Hamish on the Capitol's radar before the games even started. The morning before the game started, Hamish was taken into the launch room and was raised into the arena. Hamish's eyebrows lifted in pleasure as he took everything in. The arena was the most breathtaking place imaginable. The golden cornucopia sat in the middle of a green meadow with patches of gorgeous flowers. The sky was azure blue with puffy white clouds. The scent in the air was delightful. The meadow stretched for miles. Far in the distance in one direction there were woods, and in the other was a snow-capped mountain. When the gong sounded, many of the players were disoriented by the beauty of the place. Hamish, however, had been hypnotized by the arena for a second, but his face immediately went back to a scowl that showed extreme focus. This allowed Hamish to be one of the first to the cornucopia. He became armed with weapons and a backpack full of supplies. He was headed to the woods before most players had even stepped off their plates. 18 tributes were killed in the bloodbath of the first day. Another huge chunk of tributes were killed when they found out that the beauty of the arena was a trap. The luscious fruit dangling from the bushes, the water in the streams, and even the scent of the flowers when inhaled too directly were all poisonous. Only the rainwater and the food provided were safe to eat and drink. 
Heyman saw just how destructive this beautiful arena was. He saw fluffy golden squirrels that turned out to be carnivores, and butterflies whose stings brought agony if not death. Luckily, he was able to fend them off and keep moving. A large, well-stocked group of 10 careers began moving up the mountain looking for victims. Heyman kept his distance from the mountain and went in the opposite direction. This was good because the mountain turned out to be a volcano that erupted, killing another dozen tributes including half of the career pack. With the mountain spewing lava and the meadow offering no means of concealment, the remaining 13 tributes, including Haymitch and fellow District 12 member Mesa Lee, had no choice but to confine themselves in the woods. Haymitch had spent the whole four days walking in the same direction away from the volcanic mountain, but when he hit a maze of tightly woven hedges, he was forced to circle back into the center of the woods. Out of nowhere, Haymitch was confronted by three of the careers. As they made a move toward him, he pulled out a knife. They were much bigger and much stronger than him, but Haymitch had remarkable speed. Haymitch was able to stab two of them, but as they dropped, the third career disarmed him. The career stood over him, his knife out. He raised his weapon, about to slit Haymitch's throat, but right before he could, he fell to the ground. Haymitch looked over and saw Mesa Lee, who had sent a poisonous dart into the career's flesh, killing him instantly. Mesa Lee then said to Haymitch that they would live longer if they teamed up. Haymitch agrees, and the two became allies. They worked well together, allowing each of them to get more rest, and they worked out a system to salvage more rainwater. The two later encounter a few packs of tributes, and they fought them as a team. They were able to take them down with relative ease, as both were very skillful and resourceful. After they killed them, they would take the food and supplies that were in their packs, and would share it with each other. Haymitch eventually tells Mesa Lee that he wants to go back to the maze and see what's beyond it, thinking there might be something they can use. He tells a skeptical Mace Lee that the arena has to end somewhere. She eventually agrees, and the two make it to the maze. Here they use a blowtorch that they had stolen from one of the victim's packs and make it through the maze. When they get through, they find themselves on a flat, dry earth that leads to a cliff with jagged rocks far below. Mace Lee tells Haymitch that that's all there was and says they should go back. Haymitch, however, says that he wants to stay there. A slightly sad and disappointing point in Mace Lee says okay because there were only five tributes left including the two of them. The two of them had become close over the past few days. They had grown to trust each other, to care for one another, and to protect each other. Despite this, they knew that one of them was not going to make it. One of them was going to have to die. May as well say goodbye now anyway. I don't want it to come down to you and me. These words hurt Haymitch. He says okay without shaking her hands or even looking at her. She then walks away and she too is hurt. When she leaves Haymitch, he studies the edge of the cliff, trying to figure something out. He kicks a pebble and it falls off the cliff, apparently gone forever. But a minute later, he sits to rest and the pebble shoots up back beside him. Haymitch stares at it, puzzled. Then his face takes on a strange intensity. He lobs a rock the size of his fist over the cliff and waits. When it flies back into his hand, he starts laughing. He realizes that he was right that this was the edge of the arena and that there was a force field around it, making the rock shoot back at him. This outstanding discovery is quickly forgotten, however, when he hears Mace Lee scream. Their alliance was over, and she was the one to break it off. She had hurt Haymitch, making him feel abandoned. No one would have blamed him if he had ignored her, but Haymitch runs, runs faster than he ever has before, racing to save the girl that he had grown to trust, care for, and respect. He finally reaches her, but only in time to watch a flock of candy pink birds with long thin beaks stab her throat repeatedly. As they fly away, Haymitch runs over to her and grabs her hand. He watches as the life slowly fades out of her. He feels the grip on her hand loosening, and Haymitch knew that she was gone forever. Katniss notes that this situation bears a close resemblance to her dealing with Rue's death. If he felt the same way that Katniss did, he was blaming himself for not being there in time to save her. He was seconds away from having a completely different outcome, from still having his ally, his friend, but he was too late. Later that day, two more tributes die. This leaves just Haymitch and a girl from District 1. She was bigger than Haymitch and just as fast. When the two come face to face, they fight in what becomes a bloody battle. 
Both receive wounds that could be fatal. Her eye socket is empty, with blood dripping down her face. Haymunch has a cut in his stomach so deep that he could see his intestines. The girl manages to disarm Haymunch, but he gets away. He staggers through the beautiful woods, struggling to hold his intestines inside of him. He heads for the cliff as she stumbles after him, an axe in her hand. Right when Haymunch reaches the edge, she throws the axe. He collapses on the ground and it flies into the abyss. Both were weaponless and defenseless, their injuries too bad to fight anymore. The girl with the missing eye thinks that she can outlast Haymitch, who has started convulsing because of the huge gash in his stomach. The two sit there in agony, both slowly dying. Haymitch, however, has one bit of information that she does not. He knows that the axe is coming back. It bounces off the force field and flies back. It goes over a ducking Haymitch who was prepared, and it buries itself in the girl's head. The cannon announcing her death goes off, and her body is removed as the trumpets blow to announce Haymitch's victory. He was the second member of District 12 to ever win in the games. Haymitch was taken out of the arena and they patched him up, closing the wound on his stomach. He thought he was finally free. He was going to see his mother, his brother, and his girlfriend. It was all over. He was crowned victor and returned home. The capital, however, was angry, especially Snow. They had never intended for the force field to be used as a weapon. It made them look stupid that Haymitch had figured it out. Back in District 12, Haymitch was happier than he had been in a long time. He now lived in Victor's village. His new home was a mansion compared to the rest of the houses in the district. However, things were too good to be true. Two weeks after he was crowned Victor, Snow had his mother, brother, and girlfriend killed. This was punishment for the stunt he had pulled with the force field. Snow wanted to make an example of him for future victors. To do this, he decided to kill his loved ones rather than Haymitch himself. Haymitch, devastated and heartbroken, became a sad, pathetic man who had lost everyone and everything. On top of that, he had terrible PTSD from both the arena and from losing his family. It became so bad that he slept with a knife in his hand. He didn't let anyone in his house, and he basically sentenced himself to solitary confinement, blocking out everyone from District 12. He turned to drinking heavily and became a severe alcoholic. He hardly ever bathed and did not take great care of himself. His hair and beard got long and looked untidy, and he slowly started to lose his good looks. Haymitch had gotten a lot of money from being a victor and spent most of it on alcohol. He was often seen in the hob, tossing handfuls of money on the counter of the woman who sold white liquor. Haymitch only faced the public once a year, which was during the Hunger Games. Every year, he showed up completely wasted. The District 12 victor that had trained him died shortly after Haymitch won. At first, he tried to help them and train them, but it became hard. He would grow close to the kids, only to watch them die year after year. Doing it alone made it even harder. Most districts had multiple victors, meaning each victor could take on a tribute and try to help them get sponsors. Haymitch, however, had the responsibility of getting both tribute sponsors, and ultimately, he had to choose which kid he wanted to save and which kid he should let die, a decision that no one should have to make. But year after year, it was futile. For 23 years, he watched his trainees die, and eventually, Haymitch gave up. He no longer tried to help them. He figured that if he didn't help them or grow attached, it wouldn't affect him when they died. He literally could not take any more loss. Our mentor, you're supposed to tell us how to get sponsors and give us advice. Um, embrace the probability of your imminent death. And know in your heart that there's nothing I can do to save you. Alcohol was his only escape, and he turned to the bottle every hour of every day. Haymitch met a few victors from other districts, such as Mags from District 4. Haymitch had immense respect for her and thought that she was a very nice lady. The Capitol hardly ever televised the second quarter quell due to the fact that Haymitch made them look foolish. Over the years, Snow began to make Haymitch an example for other victors who tried to defy him. One example of this is the way that Snow threatened to kill Finnick O'Dare's girlfriend if he didn't do what he said. He showed Finnick what he had done to Haymitch's girlfriend and family, and Finnick decided that he didn't want the same fate for his own loved ones, and he did Snow's bidding. When the 74th Hunger Games came around, Haymitch once again showed up drunk on stage during the reaping. He tried to give Effie a hug, which she narrowly managed to fend off. He later points at the camera and either addresses the audience or taunts the Capitol. He's so drunk that it's unclear. He then completely falls off the stage and knocks himself unconscious. 
After Katniss and Peeta had been chosen and were on their way to the capital, Haymitch vomited all over the expensive carpet on the train and then fell in the mess, getting puke all over himself. Katniss and Peeta help him up and put him in his bathtub. They turn the shower on, which Haymitch is so drunk he barely even notices as they clean the vomit off of him. The next morning on the train, Haymitch drank even more. A frustrated Peeta took the glass out of Haymitch's hand and accidentally dropped it on the floor. Haymitch responds to this by punching Peeta square in the jaw, knocking him from his chair. When he reaches for more alcohol, Katniss drives her knife into the table between his hand and the bottle. This makes him realize that he actually got a pair of fighters that stood a chance in the arena. He makes a deal with the two of them, that as long as they don't interfere with his drinking, he would agree to stay sober enough to train them. Haymitch held up to his part of the deal. He told them not to show their skills in front of the other tributes, but rather to wait until the individual assessments. He also tells them to stay by each other's side every minute. Haymitch thinks it's hilarious when Katniss tells him how she shot an arrow into the game maker's direction during her private assessment. Nice shooting, sweetheart. He's very happy with both Katniss and Peeta's individual scores, which are both very high. With Haymitch and Effie having viable tributes for the first time, the two grow closer as they train and help Katniss and Peeta. Later on down the road, Peeta asks Haymitch to train him separately from Katniss because he had feelings for her. While training them for their interviews, Peeta was easy as they came up with a plan to make Peeta say that he's in love with Katniss. But Haymitch struggles to train Katniss for the interview. Haymitch starts to drink halfway through and eventually gives up, telling her to just answer the questions and not to let the audience see how much she hates them. Before Katniss and Peeta go on stage for their interviews, he tells them that they still have to act like a happy pair. During Katniss's interview, Caesar mentions Haymitch falling off the stage at the reaping and the camera focuses on him. Haymitch waves it away good-naturedly and points back at Katniss. After Peeta's interview, Katniss gets furious and Haymitch tells her that he helped her immensely. He did you a favor. He made me look weak. He made you look desirable. They were now the star-crossed lovers of District 12, something that Haymitch would later use to their advantage. Before the two went into the arena, Haymitch's final words of advice were to run away from the cornucopia when the gong sounded and to stay alive. The same advice he gave them on the train, but this time he wasn't drunk or laughing when he said it. During the games, Haymitch and Effie lined up sponsors for the two of them, using the star-crossed lovers as their angle. Haymitch, knowing that only one of them can survive, helps Katniss. His thinking was that she had a better chance of winning, although it is implied that Peeta might have told him to do this. Haymitch, however, holds her sponsor's gifts, waiting for her to push the romance between her and Peeta farther. Haymitch is thrilled when they both come back alive. He gives both of them a hug when they return. Before Katniss goes to her final interview with Caesar, Haymitch tells her that the Capitol is furious about the stunt she and Peeta pulled with the berries because they saw it as an act of rebellion. When he, Katniss, and Peeta return home to District 12, all three of them now live in Victor's village. Days after they got back, Haymitch begins drinking heavily again, and as time went on, his drinking became progressively worse. He begins to get so drunk that he sleeps for most of the day. One day, Haymitch is passed out drunk, and Katniss tries to wake him up, but fails. She then resorts to dumping a bucket of water on him. <laughs> Eventually, he had to go on the victory tour with Katniss and Peeta along with Effie. Katniss goes to his compartment, and when the train stops for fuel, she suggests that they go outside. She tells him about President Snow visiting her. Snow had told her that she had to sell the star-crossed lover's act, or he'll kill all of her friends and family. Haymitch agrees to coach Katniss through the Madly in Love charade, which she has to keep up with Peeta, but they leave Peeta in the dark. Haymitch and Effie help prepare the two for their victory speech at District 11. Peeta and Katniss both go off script, which leads to an elderly man being shot. Afterwards, Haymitch interrogates Katniss and Peeta for answers, and he and Katniss confess to Peeta how the Capitol had threatened Katniss. He threatened to kill my family. Well, I have family too. Okay, people that I need to protect. What about them? Who protects them? Haymitch continues to help them throughout the victory tour, making sure that they don't repeat what happened in District 11. When they return to District 12, Haymitch goes back to drinking. When the 75th Hunger Games is announced, Snow declares that the third quarter quell tributes will be reaped from the existing pool of victors. <laughs> Haymitch immediately gets a visit from Peeta, begging him to let him go in the arena instead of Haymitch. Katniss arrived hours later, and Haymitch laughed because Peeta had come so much earlier. Haymitch then asks her what she wants, and Katniss replies saying, I'm here to drink. And Haymitch passes her his drink. Katniss refuses to hand it back, so Haymitch pulls out another. 
The two get drunk, and Haymitch says that even if he is reaped, Peta would volunteer for him to make sure that he could protect her in the arena, and Haymitch could protect her outside the arena. Katniss asks him what he'll do if Peta's name is drawn, and she tries to convince him that he should go into the Hunger Games instead of Peta. Haymitch agrees because he feels as if he owes Peta after choosing to save Katniss and not him during the last Hunger Games. When it comes time for the reaping, Haymitch's name is called, but barely has time to frown before Peta volunteers. I volunteer as tribute. I can't let you do that. I can't stop it. Haymitch gets a bit of a surprise when he walks in on Peta and Katniss watching the footage of the second quarter quell and watching Haymitch in the arena. Haymitch begins to plan the rebellion. He jokes and says, stay alive, and urges them to befriend other tributes. When the games begin, he works with District 4, and later Districts 3 and 7, when Katniss and Peta ally with Beatty, Wyrus, and Joanna on top of Finnick and Mags. Effie gets the four of them gifts and gives Haymitch a gold bracelet. Haymitch gives that gold bracelet to Finnick in honor of their alliance. Good thing we're allies, right? Where did you get that? Where do you think? Little did Katniss and Peta know that they were all working with that year's game maker, Plutarch, behind the scenes to help the second rebellion begin. When Katniss blows up the forest field, she's rescued by a hovercraft, but they leave Peta and Joanna. Haymitch, Beatty, Finnick, and Plutarch gather together and talk about what has happened and how they should move forward. When Katniss enters the room, an annoyed Haymitch explains everything that has recently happened. Katniss is so enraged with all of Haymitch's lies that she cuts his face with her nails. And since he can't attack her, they both yell at each other until she's taken away. Haymitch goes to District 13, the underground district thought to be destroyed, and he helps plan the rest of the rebellion. Here he struggles a lot when he's completely cut off from alcohol as they don't allow it in 13. He goes through terrible withdrawal and is put in a permanent bad mood. I want a bottle so bad I'm ready to distill my own turnips. When they first arrived, Haymitch and Plutarch had to fight hard against Coin, District 13's corrupt president, to keep Effie alive. Coin saw her as part of the capital and a threat, but the two were able to convince her otherwise. Haymitch sees an interview of Peta who's in the capital and hears Peta say that he shouldn't have trusted Haymitch. This cuts deep, as the two used to be so close that they were willing to sacrifice their lives for one another. After watching Katniss and Impropos, he says, and that, my friends, is how a revolution dies. Haymitch later calls for a meeting with Katniss and the other rebels. Here he asks everyone to come up with a moment when Katniss has ever touched or moved them. After everyone finishes, he states that she did all of them by herself with no one telling her what to do. Haymitch later tells Katniss to say what she wants and she asks him why he let Peta get captured. Haymitch sadly asks why she let Peta out of her sight. The two then begin to reconnect and comfort each other. Haymitch tells her the plan to shoot the propo live in action, and he tells her that he's still her mentor. When Katniss goes to District 8 to film the propo, the district gets bombed. A frantic Haymitch yells her name in her earpiece, but she turns it off. This made Haymitch furious. Despite this, he did not tell Coin about Katniss's disobedience. When they return to 13, Katniss gets sent to the hospital where Haymitch visits her. There, he drops her earpiece in her hands and told her to wear it at all times. He then jokingly says that he's going to surgically implant it on her skull if she disobeys him again. Haymitch was supposed to go to District 12 with Katniss, Gale, and the production crew to film a propo in the wasteland that was once their home, but he ended up not being able to go because he was struggling a great deal with his alcoholism and withdrawal. In another interview with Peta, Haymitch realizes that he was warning them about an attack on 13. Thanks to Haymitch and Katniss convincing Coin to go on lockdown, everyone in the district was saved. Later on, Haymitch informs Katniss about the rescue team to save Peta, Joanna, and Annie from the capital. Katniss decides to get deep with Haymitch and asks him what his relationship with Snow was like, and Haymitch opens up and tells her how Snow had killed his family and girlfriend. The two share this moment and grow closer because of it. When the rescue team returns and they see the damage that the capital has done on Peta by brainwashing him to hate Katniss, Haymitch is desperate to get him back to normal. An angry Katniss begs Haymitch to let her at least go to District 2, and he pulls some strings to allow her to go. While there, Katniss gets good news when she hears Haymitch in her earpiece telling her that Peta made a great leap forward in his recovery. Haymitch helps prep the perfect team for propos with Katniss, Gale, Finnick, and a few others, all led by Boggs. Before the team leaves for the capital, Haymitch wishes them good luck. 
The rebels eventually win when bombs were dropped in the refugee area of the capital. During this, Katniss gets hurt badly and is taken to a capital hospital. Hamish visits her and smiles when she fades in and out of consciousness. Hamish was among the very few surviving Hunger Games participants and is called to a meeting where they are tasked with the decision to have one more Hunger Games with the capital's children. The vote ends up coming down to Hamish and he votes yes. At Snow's execution, Katniss ends up killing Coin instead of Snow. Hamish works hard to make sure that Katniss doesn't get in trouble for killing Coin. In her trial, he and a few others presented Katniss as a traumatized, borderline insane warrior who shouldn't be punished any further. Hamish is very happy when his old friend is cleared of all charges and happy that his hard work of fighting for her freedom paid off. After this, Hamish visits Katniss, who was still under house arrest, to tell her that her trial was over and that she was in the clear. Hamish was asked if he wanted to be part of the new government that was forming under the leadership of Commander Paler of District 8. He decided, however, that the government had no place for him and that he wanted to be sent back home. He is commanded to bring Katniss with him, as she was not permitted to be in largely populated areas after the result of her trial. Before he left, Hamish talked to Katniss's mother, who told him she was moving to District 4 to work in a hospital. She thanked Hamish for everything that he had done for Katniss, and she made Hamish Katniss's temporary guardian. Hamish and Katniss were taken by a hovercraft back to District 12. On the way, he tells Katniss that her mother wanted to speak to her when she was ready, and told her that in the meantime, she had made Hamish her legal guardian. The hovercraft landed at 12, which besides Victor's village, was all but destroyed. A few days later, Hamish and Katniss welcomed Peta home as well. Katniss and Peta eventually have two kids, who Hamish gets to know quite well. For years, Hamish cut people out of his life and was miserable. When Katniss and Peta entered, however, we saw the kind, brave, and inspirational man that we all know and love today come out for the first time in a long time. He owed those kids and fought to protect them. He always saw himself as their mentor, their guardian, their fellow soldier, and their friend. Hamish lived a semi-sober and happy rest of his life in District 12. Thank you so much for watching guys, you can follow me on social media, links for that will be down below. If you like this video, make sure you press that subscribe button to help grow the channel. I want to give a huge shout out to all my patrons listed below. If you want to be featured on the next video, plus get a bunch of other rewards, check out my Patreon. Again, thank you so much for watching, and look out for more great videos on the way.